Hello, this is Dan Nailman, Nice Wander. Uh, Isaac, how are you? Doing great. How are you doing, Dan? Well, I'm doing uh, all things considered. I always say I'm, I'm uh, physically and mentally doing very well um, <laughs> in these crazy times that we live in. Uh, and I think it's also very important for us to not only do self-care, but to uh, you know, touch base with others and ask them how they're doing. Very important. You know. Yeah, I think you gave the the most legitimate, you know, best possible answer anyone can give under the current kind of contemporary circumstances. I think ultimately, if anyone isn't saying, isn't 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 adding a caveat such as, you know, under the circumstances, I'm doing okay physically and mentally. I mean, all power to you, man. That's great to hear. Well, thank you. I mean, it's you know, and I every day I am grateful to be a, a musician and an artist, uh, as well as somebody who can host a podcast and. You know, uh, the, I started doing this show in, in 2015 uh, because I realized the purpose of my, of my work, whatever it is that I do, is to uh, help create cultural and economic transition because I could see our world, our society changing, our communities, everything, every part of it on every level is changing. And, and understanding history I've seen how important culture is, you know, even in my own life, you know, how music you know, has played a tremendous part in my life from you know, as long as I can remember, I've been a musician. Um, I was singing five years old in church, you know, professionally, you know, as a trained voice. And I, I, I'm assuming my parents taught me because I don't remember learning. Uh, and uh, so, and it's been an interesting journey, you know, uh, in, in every part of, of that along the way, you know, finally I got around to, you know, doing it professionally, you know, making a couple albums, uh, doing a lot of shows, although I didn't get the tour really, but I did a lot of shows um, in the uh, Indianapolis area. And also when I lived here in California, I did some, um, but you know, I had to work for a living otherwise. So it was a part-time job. Right, but I got some uh, amazing stories you know, to tell and a couple of great albums that I'm very, very proud of. Um, and I wrote a book, you know, along the way. Um, and uh, can I ask you one question briefly? Yeah. Like, who are your who are your musical influences? Would you say? Oh, oh gosh, um, I've got so many. Um, do we have all night? <laughs> um, well, I can say. I can answer that question in part by saying I've had a chance to meet or have face-to-face -face, uh, contact with some of my favorites that inspired me tremendously. Like uh, when I was quite young, I had a face-to-face -face encounter with Freddie Mercury of Queen. Uh, and I, he's one of the few people I've met many who I, I just froze. I didn't know what to say. Like there he is and he's looking at me and I'm looking at him, right? Um, and, uh, but I did get a chance to have actual conversations with Brian May and John Deacon of Queen. Um, and as well as, uh, I got to meet Paul McCartney. I got to have a conversation with Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Hey, hold on, hold on, hold so, on, hold on. Let's, oh. <laughs> let's, 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 let's stop on Freddie Mercury really quick. So, yeah. so you met Freddie Mercury, like what were the, what were the exact circumstances under which you met Freddie Mercury, uh, like rock God extraordinaire? Well, I was, uh, at the time, I was going to a uh, university in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, the University of Oklahoma, and I talked my uh, friends from high school that I was going to school with there into uh, driving down to Dallas, Texas, to see the show there at the convention how long? How long of a drive is that from Oklahoma to Dallas? That's got to be at least like four or five hours. I have well, no I idea. Say, I would say that's probably right, yeah. And uh, so, obviously, we had to, we weren't going to drive back. Um, although we had done that before, crazily, after a show. Um, so we arranged to have some fun and we, we uh, got a hotel room. And uh, we found the Hilton Hotel, which was the closest to the convention center. And uh, it was a great show, obviously. So I'd seen him before uh, a couple of times. And so we were in the lobby about 1.30 in the morning, here comes Freddie Mercury with a, a really big guy that looked like a bodyguard. And so basically, uh, my friend and I, we found ourselves, we, they, uh, we found ourselves like, oh, they left the elevator open. And we just kind of walked in and the elevator closed. 
And all of a sudden I'm realizing I'm standing almost right next to Freddie Mercury. And I just didn't know what to say. And they got off or the were elevator. You, were you completely frozen in fear? I would have been frozen in terror. In, see, the year after that and, th and three years after that, with uh, also getting to talk to Brian May and to John Deacon in different places. And uh, so actual real human conversations, you know, where you can talk about just being a musician, which I did, and they totally respected me as that. And I, to this day, I think, my God, not only was their music profound to me, changed my life, but they were just regular human beings to me, treating me like a real person and not like a fan, which, mm. you know, like John Deacon even asked me, so what, what instrument do you play? I mean, sure. it was so cool. Yeah. And uh, well, there's more to that story, but I'll, I'll tell that later. Hold on, hold on. So, like, before, <laughs> we move on from, before we move on from Queen, your top three Queen songs all time. Oh my God. It's tough, tough, really tough to pick three, I would think, alone, but. Under Pressure. Uh, Solid choice. Is, is probably one of my all time favorite songs of any genre, actually, because uh, I also love David Bowie. Uh, yeah. And I know his Piano Man as well. I've talked to him about that song. Um, and see what else? Uh, one Vision. Probably is another one. Oh, great choice. Yeah, I'm really glad you chose that because I would have forgotten to and I would have regretted it. So yeah, One Vision is an incredible song. And uh, and uh, um, uh, Bright and Rock, and Now I'm Here, um, Bad Leroy Brown. Oh, there's, there's just there's just so many. <laughs> yeah, there's so many. I mean, there's I would so probably many. say I'm going to go with Radio Gaga. Mm hmm. I'm going to go with Who Wants to Live Forever because I love Highlander and the whole Highlander soundtrack. Oh, yeah. And uh, Don't Stop Me Now, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, but like there's really like 45 <laughs> of, your, of your favorite, anyone's favorite Queen songs. If you're a Queen, if you went through any kind of Queen phase, I recently had a conversation with a dear friend of mine. And I think to him, like being into Queen was like a phase someone had and they, they moved on from it. But I, I, I had to disagree with him. Because oh, queen, I, I felt queen fandom lives, lives on. Queen to me, I always felt, uh, at least until, um, well, really until um, the movie Bohemian Rhapsody. I think Queen I, it has been underrated, actually. Uh, they're right up there with the Beatles, in my opinion. They'll they'll be, you know, in the rock genre. They will be like the Beethoven and Chopin, you know, that they'll never be forgotten. You know, they're profound and and so many. Well, they cross ways. like they 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 kind of cross genres. You know, it sounds very like like a musical or an opera or something combined with like rock. Um, and just Freddie Mercury's vocals, like as a as a vocalist, you know, the guy had like a machine gun of a voice. It was like insane. He'd just do things that like no one else does. You know. And I saw it live uh, four times, and 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 I also learned later in in uh, that John Deacon, the bass player, uh, he had a degree in electronics. So maybe that's why it sounded so good in really crappy auditoriums. I, used, I generally try not to use four letter words, if you know what I mean. Uh, there's another <laughs> word I could use there. Uh, but I saw the first time I saw them was in the Indiana Convention Center, horrible sound ordinarily, uh, but somehow Queen made it work. And, uh, and Freddie Mercury's voice just filled that hall. Uh, I was just like blown away. I couldn't sleep that night when I got home. Mm. Uh, I was just so excited about, you know, how great it was. It was, you know, and I've had that experience numerous times. I, uh, the first time I saw Yes, I felt like I was in a, on a, in a whole nother world. Uh, the Going for the One tour was absolutely amazing. The song Awaken, I highly recommend that to anyone. Just heavenly, if there's such a word. Um, and Peter Gabriel's uh, World of Music, Arts and Dance Tour uh, was, that was a festival, uh, uh, an international festival of music and food and workshops and uh, it's just so much fun. It was, I was there all day and I didn't want to leave. And I wish it wouldn't end, you know what I mean? It was one of those- Wait, So Peter, Peter Gabriel went on tour, but there were also like, there was like food and workshops and like, mm -hmm. it was like a traveling, like carnival-esque kind of thing. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, like he Peter, did. And Peter Gabriel was the mastermind? He was the mastermind behind it. Um, he started doing it in, in uh, Europe, right? He did, he, and uh, he would do it like once a year. 
uh, at least once a year in England somewhere, uh, or you know, um, you know, close to where he would live, you know, um, and he has a studio. And he decided somehow he got it to go on tour to like six American cities. And I, wow, I got that's to awesome. see it um, and uh, here in Southern California. And it was, and he had, uh, he was the headliner, of course, <laughs> with the uh, Burundi uh, drummers from Africa. And then he also had Crowded House, Siggy Marley, uh, Stereo MCs, um, you know, and then he had a smaller stage too. I didn't see any of the shows there. But they had food from all over the world. They had workshops like I, I had time to stick my head in on, a, I think, a children's workshop of some kind and an artistic workshop. And then I stuck my head in one tent and it was a belly dancing workshop. And these big fat guys were in there. It was so funny. I was like, I had these belly dancers from India or wherever, <laughs> or wherever they were from. And it was hilarious. But you, every, it was such a, it was such a wonderful environment. It just, you know, it just, uh, you would have seen a smile on my face all day long. It was just fantastic. I really miss those kinds of things. You know, I think he pioneered that kind of event. You know, that was before Coachella and all that kind of thing. And World of Music, Arts and Dance, look it up, WOMAD, uh, fantastic. And yeah, I'm uh, a big, big, big fan of music, you know, uh, obviously, you know, changing yeah, yeah. Life. Well, I mean, but at the beginning there, you went on, a, you had to, I had to slow it down because you were naming off some names there, but you said, did you say you met Brian Wilson? Speaking of rock gods. Yes, uh, I was a media wow. ambassador for a UN um, peace program called Adopt a Minefield. Uh, and uh, that's how I met Paul McCartney also. And I met Jeff Lynn. Uh, 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 the Electrolyte Orchestra producer, you know, Traveling Wilburys, all of that. Oh, wow, wow. And uh, so, but I met Brian uh, because um, he was Paul uh, McCartney's uh, special guest. Uh, what, what it was, was a benefit uh, for Adopt a Minefield. And I, I went um, just kind so of as, as this, a- This was part of like a, like a massive like demining de program that the UN was mm -hmm. involved in at the time? Like this would have been in the 90s or? Well, this was in the 2000s. Early 2000s uh, it it yeah. was a program though that they had, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, a charter or whatever for 10 years from 1999 to 2009. And I connected with it in 2002. I was looking actually for some uh, information uh, about a Paul McCartney tour because I wanted to take my brother for his birthday because we, you know, we're big Beatle fans and, you know, and, um, and I, when I went to Paul's website, I found this link and, and I uh, had already had a rock band in the Indianapolis area at that point. And I was doing local charities and things like that. And I thought, you know, I really want to do something on a larger scale because the community was really paying attention to me. You know, I was getting a lot of gigs. I was on television there locally, you know, with my band. Um, and so, so people were paying attention, right? And it wasn't for me. I, I thought I need to take advantage of this opportunity, right? Uh, to, to do something bigger than local, to still continue to do local charity, but do something bigger, right? So what I did is I reached, you know, um, I reached out to them and, and I said, I'm really excited about this benefit concert that you have in LA that I saw on Paul McCartney's website. And they said, oh, well, we, we're, we're, gonna have, we're gonna have a table there at Paul McCartney's concert. Would you like to work it for us? And I said, oh, I've already got tickets, you know? I said, well, can you find people in the, in the music um, scene there that would be interested? And uh, it, that took me all of about 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, so then they reached out to me and, and, I, uh, and when I said, I'm gonna go to the, uh, uh, the event, the first, I went to a gala event here in LA cause I would still um, uh, come out here on vacation even though I had moved back to Indiana for a while because of personal and family reasons and that's why I, I, then I had a rock band there and all that kind of stuff and I, that's why I ended up staying for a while um, and um, so I did local events you know with them you know in, in clubs and you know it was probably one of the few people that actually had you know uh, an event like in a nightclub you know with bands and things like that mm -hmm. to raise mm -hmm. help raise money and awareness and uh, they even sent somebody from the state department to come and speak you know, uh, which was pretty amazing. Uh, the whole experience just was mind boggling, you know, to me, I felt so honored. And then, then they asked me to, uh, how would you uh, uh, like to be in, a, in the press corps? So the second year I went, I was in the press corps, like the Hollywood press corps. 
But the first year, um, Paul McCartney always did the music, right? And then he had a special guest. And so it was a uh, Paul McCartney band, special guest, uh, Brian Wilson and the Wonder Mints, which was his band at the time. Right. And um, so there I am, I'm in the, the cocktail VIP area. And uh, he, I said hi to him, right? And then um, he comes up to me then a little, a few minutes later and just starts talking to me. And so I, I talked to him about music, you know, and, uh, and then I don't know if you've ever been at an event like that, but, but there were so many people there, right? Including, you know, uh, celebrities from the Hollywood community that sure. everybody connects with each other. You get like conversations for like three minutes and that's all, right? Because it, it's, not, it's not that you're limited. It's just that the same thing was happening to Julie Louise Dreyfus, you know, or, you know, Rob Reiner, you know what I mean? Everybody was just wanting to, you yeah, you have three to minute conversation. Up, right. Because those three, those three minute conversations actually would have a lot of currency too, you know, oh, yeah. if, if you're there to like see people and talk to people. Yeah. And so I'm talking. So did to you Brian. bogart Brian Wilson? Well, I asked him what he was listening to right now, and uh, he. Oh, you tickled his music, his musical bow. Uh, did he go? Course. Did he wax poetic forever about it? Did he? Was it like that song, "Busy Doing Nothing," one of my all-time no. favorite songs of all time? What he said was, "I'm still listening to my Phil Spector records to this day." He said, um, and uh, and then I've also been listening to the Backstreet Boys. And I said, well, that makes, that makes perfect sense. I mean, it's, he likes vocal harmonies. That's his thing. That's what he loves the most. Uh, and while I'm talking, I see, you know how in the periphery of my vision, I see somebody standing there and I looked and it was Rob Reiner. And it was just the three of us, right? And that's when Rob came in and got his three minutes. And it was so interesting. This is, you'll love this story. Um, Rob Reiner was like a little kid. And he says, he goes, Brian, are you going to sing with Paul? You know, and Brian was really shy all of a sudden. And he said, um, yeah, um, we rehearsed uh, Let It Be, and I'm really nervous. And I'm standing there like, here's two grown men being with their guard down. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I was just like, to, you know, um, I've been very uh, fortunate to have experiences like this, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm thank you for letting me share that because. Yeah, uh, amazing. It's, uh, the, so Brian Wilson, his, his entire disposition changed. He became very vulnerable, lost all of his confidence and said, yeah, we've been rehearsing, let it be. And I'm really nervous about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's such an amazing Brian Wilson anecdote. That's totally believable too. And I've, I met uh, uh, on my show, I had uh, uh, Denny Tedesco. Uh, and if you know who that is, he's the son of Tommy Tedesco, uh, who is uh, one of the Wrecking Crew. If you know what the Wrecking Crew is, they were the, oh, sure. uh, um, and they also were part of Wall of Sound, many of them, the Wall of Sound of Phil Spector. Right, so, Phil Spector, uh, like a noted music producer and Murderer? Did he die yes. recently in jail? Yeah, he, he died recently of COVID, um, and uh, yeah, and he was convicted and in, and in, uh, in uh, when he's been in prison for at least a decade. Uh, how but, would you how would you describe the the quote unquote wall of sound sound to those that aren't familiar with it? Well, what it is is that you can of course go to the episodes on on the show and, and learn more about it. I have a three parter with with Danny Tedesco, who was uh, the producer of the Wrecking Crew film. And his father was Tommy Tedesco, the guitarist, you know, the, the well-known guitarist, the studio right. musician. And uh, essentially what it was is that he, he, uh, there were three piano players and one of them was on my show, Don Randy. Um, there were three guitar players. There were, you know, at least, you know, well, depending on the ba bass, sometimes there only was one, but, you know, there'd be multiple bass players. There'd be multiple backup vocalists, like, you know, Sonny and Cher were vocalists at one point. The... Uh, uh, Darlene Love, you know, people like that, um, you know, uh, as well as the Ronettes, you know, there were, everything was done in multiple layers, right, because they only had like maybe four tracks, right, or maybe up to eight tracks, but he wanted to have this full sound, like this rock orchestra, or this music they, And they record with all these people in a very tiny room, if I understand correctly, right, or a, a relatively small room. 
in comparison uh, to like if you were to compare it to like Abbey Road or, or you know or it might be comparable to Sunset Sound here in Los Angeles you know where Van Halen people are Prince recorded but okay. but, but okay. it was still yeah relatively small in comparison to you know uh, Abbey Road or something like that's main room or you know but um, yeah it was a it was just a, a huge massive sound you know that he wanted to create in the records if you're familiar with all the girl groups especially like the Ronettes group you know like be my baby and the do sure. run, run stuff like that well and there's, and there's a lot of a lot of times you're listening to those songs and it's like you, you even have trouble distinguishing which instrument is which because they're playing the same note all together and there's just so many instruments on top of each other that it sounds like a piano or a bass or or the two of them combined with something else it's like it, it's really quite magical actually exactly it's, it is and, and i highly recommend the movie and i highly recommend watching the episodes yeah uh, so yeah um, but like, uh, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. So you must have, oh, did you also meet Paul McCartney around the same time? Mm -hmm. So what yeah. was that like? Like, how, what, what was it like to meet Paul McCartney? Like, what was the circumstance? You just, was it like, did you get a th the three minute chat with him before Rob Reiner came and asked him? No. Are you, are you going to sing with Brian? <laughs> no, actually, I, I, I should have met him three times, but at that same um, uh, wine and cheese uh, opening reception, uh, he and uh, Heather, his wife at that time, walked through. They were going to go to the VIP room, and they walked through to say hi to people. And right when I was getting ready to shake his hand, this guy comes up to him with this this book in his hand, like with really nice paper in it. And obviously, he'd been going around to all the you know to celebrities to get their signatures. And he went up to Paul right at that moment, and Paul was coming right to, to me so I could shake his hand. I had I literally even had my hand out to shake his. And he turned to the security guy and, and said, get that guy out of here. You know, and obviously that guy was just there to get the signatures. Paul is very, apparently is just very concerned about, you gotta be there for the cause, you know? Right. And uh, so I did get to meet him in the Hollywood press corps the next year. And I had the only other person in my life other than Freddie Mercury where I had that frozen moment. But I did say hi to him. Uh, and he said, uh, how are you? You know, and I said, hi, Paul. You know, I just, I froze. I didn't know what to, and I, I, I could have asked him I, I, would have, I would have fallen onto the ground in, in terror. <laughs> but you know what? The next, the next time I got a chance to see him was two years later, because I went to four of the events, four years in a row, I was a media ambassador for, for this, uh, for the Adopt a Minefield. And I did, uh, the year that Tony Bennett was there, he, um, he was walking to the press area. And I said, I'm going to go say hi to Paul and shake his hand and look him in the eye. And I did. So he was busy, obviously, getting to the press corps. So I, I said, hello, Paul, and, sh and looked into his eye and shook his hand, you know. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I wish I could have talked to him. I, I could have asked him a question or two. Um, but when I was in the press corps, I'd never done anything like that in my life. And I was standing next to, uh, this, uh, young lady, this beautiful young lady from ITN, uh, in, uh, in England. Okay. And I, I told her, I didn't know what ITN was. And she said, well, you know, like in your country, you have, um, CBS, NBC and ABC. Say well, we're, we have a similar kind of thing in in the UK. We have uh, BBC One, BBC Two, and ITN. And so I am a reporter for ITN, and I am doing a segment with Paul for the equivalent of what you would call your Good Morning America show on ABC. And uh, so she said, and he will definitely stop and talk to me. He won't be able to talk to everybody in the line here. There's too many of us. He will stop and talk to me because he knows me and this has kind of been pre-arranged or something and says and i see you have a handheld recorder you're welcome to record this interview and you own it use it for whatever you want so i still oh, have nice. that, that interview oh cool um, so somewhere <laughs> i have so many different formats of stuff it's crazy um <laughs> but uh yeah, that was a great experience. I got to write about it. They, I was a featured writer in their 2004 newsletter. So it was a wonderful experience. Um, yeah. Met people from all over the world, uh, from the U.S. military, from the State Department, from uh, entertainment industry. Got to interview Jay Leno, uh, Mickey Rooney, 
uh, and uh, got to dance with his wife during Good Vibrations. <laughs> Uh, just a lot of stories. I, I've got so many stories. I, 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 well, I, could, I, I, I could talk on that. Yeah, we've got limited time, so I have to ask you. I have to ask you about. So you, so you interviewed also one of. Um, I mean, speaking of the Beatles, I think there's like someone who really is of similar stature of, in my mind to the Beatles, but um, Stevie Wonder. And you interviewed uh, one of his producers. Yes, Robert Margulis is his name. Uh, ah. He and he uh, and uh, his partner uh, uh, Cecil Malcolm Cecil um were co-producers co-engineers on five of stevie's albums and you can see the whole story on the now man which show. which which five albums like was it the uh, 70s era was it it was, was it, it started um well the, um, the first album was um i can't think of the name of it to be honest uh but he, he i mean stevie wonder was obviously he was under contract for many years it was basically before he turned 18 at uh Motown. Motown, right? correct. And so he's little at that point they called him Little Stevie Wonder and, and he didn't write any of his own songs really. Um, but he had a hit obviously with Signed Seal Delivered, and I think he had a, a number of hits during that time. Yes, exactly. And he but he was getting tired of the the standard, you know, Motown format, right? Just like Michael Jackson did with the Jackson Five, you know, same kind of thing. He wanted to do something different. And uh, Malcolm Cecil and uh, Robert Margulov uh, were, you know, uh, in New York City, and they had this uh, huge synthesizer called Tonto, and I, it, it's each letter stands for something I can't even, I can't remember right offhand. But the, it's when synthesizers were like humongous; you had to put on a huge girder and it's the size of a small room, you know. And um, so. The, uh, the the famous jazz flautist, uh, can't think Herbie Mann, I think is his name, um, w owned the studio where they were working, and the the um, he heard them one night making music on this thing, and and uh, he said, you know, that's you know, if you want, I'll give you some money, and and uh, uh, you can record uh, make an album with that, and they they said, are you kidding me? This is not music. And he said, well, I think it is. And here he gave him some money and, and released the album. Well, long of the short of it is that Stevie Wonder heard the album because it got a great review on Rolling Stone. And they're going, oh, what the? <laughs> We're just playing around and we got a great review in Rolling Stone. And Stevie Wonder heard the album. He loved it. And, he, and that's the direction he wanted to go was with, with synthesizers. So basically, that those three people, when they got in the studio, they changed RB music forever. And the synth that was the first time the synthesizer was really used in R&B music was with Stevie Wonder. And of course, you know, the first album that made an impact was Talking Book, you know. So sure. I, I, heard a, I heard a four channel version of um, uh, Superstition, actually, that he recorded at that time. Uh, that's a whole other interesting story in and of itself. But um, they won uh, Grammys with Stevie for uh, Intervisions, which had Chris Higher Ground and Living for the Living City. for the City. Yeah, they won uh, the Grammys uh, for that. But uh, they made five albums with them. Well, um, who was it? I think didn't Paul McCartney win? A, no, it was Paul Simon won a Grammy. It was the year Stevie Wonder was in that um, horrible like car accident and didn't release an album because he'd been winning Grammy best best album Grammy year after year. And then I think Paul Simon won it the year he was out and he, he the first person he thanked was Stevie Wonder for not releasing an album that year. That's right. Because he had been dominating at the Grammys. Yeah. That's right. It was yeah. 1976. Yeah. He, for two years in a row, or was it three years in a row, he had best album of the year, I think it was. Yeah. That's oh. never, never been done before, I don't think. But uh, such a good And like his stuff all basically everything he started making when he when he was doing his own sound like starting with music from my mind was i think the first one he did post motown right and then That's up right. until i think songs of the key of life I, I can listen to those like five or six albums every day if i had to you know happily yeah the 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 sax player um has been on my show he's finally at age 70 said i i need to have my own band now um uh, and uh his name That's good is for the young man i wish yeah. him the best of luck yeah trevor lawrence is his name he uh the his his uh, quartet or quintet whatever came on the show and uh, and uh, we had members of Mandrill also on the show in that episode yeah the Nail Man show we've had a lot of stuff um, you know I finally got around to performing myself it 
you know, on the show performing live. And uh, eventually one of those tracks got me a, a gig on America's Got Talent uh, in 2020, right before the pandemic. So um, that was an, an interesting experience. Got to sing in front of thousands of people on March the 7th of last year, 2020. Really? Yeah. Was that, and, was that just like a rush? Was that, had you ever performed? Because you've been performing for a while, but that's got to be the biggest show you've ever done by a ways, right? That's the biggest audience. I mean, I, I think the most I had is a thousand. Uh, the, the, but I got to sing in front of two different audiences that day. Um, and uh, I got to do my sound check in front of uh, uh, the afternoon show. And then the full house was, was already there. And then I, I performed for the, for the uh, judges in the audience uh, in the evening because they do two shows a day. And uh, so I would say probably about 5,000 people that day. And then, you know, within 10 days, we had the lockdown, <laughs> you know, so it was a very interesting but strange month, right, uh, 2020.